Now, you're going to hear a great panel, and I'm going to introduce the moderator, and she'll introduce everyone else. This is Harriet Tregoni, who is now the director of the Office of Planning in Washington, D.C. I think you invented the word smart. When I read your bio biography, way back when she was a child in Pennsylvania, she organized the first multidisciplinary effort that looked at sustainability, transportation, economy, and then she was the first director of smart growth in the country, in the state of Maryland, on and on and on. But I want to have Harriet introduce the panel and about the subject we have today. Welcome. So as our panel gets seated, I'm going to give you really brief um, introductions of them. Uh, they're all very distinguished people, and you all know how to Google, so I'm not going to waste our valuable time going on and on about their incredibly uh, extensive and distinguished resumes. Uh, to my left is Shelley Petitia. Uh, she serves as Senior Advisor for Sustainable Housing and Communities at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. She's a very well-respected expert in growth management and urban policy, and she's responsible in this important job for advancing housing and communities that purport, uh, promote affordable living, uh, sustainable uh, communities. She's also um, very much the lead person in HUD's interagency effort with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Transportation um, and, and their effort to help improve access to affordable housing and more transportation choices. To Shelley's left, is Arako Landesman, who was confirmed by the United States Senate on August 7, 2009, as the 10th chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. Prior to joining NEA, he was a Broadway theater producer, but also very much an entrepreneur, an educator, a philanthropist, and uh, you know, an all-around amazing person. We're very lucky to have him in, uh, in Washington <laughs> and at the NEA. Next to uh, Rocco is Aaron Flynn who's the Urban Development Director of the Portland Development Corpor Commission. Um, Aaron uh, basically is responsible for the agency's overall strategy and directs the work of PDC's Central City, Neighborhood, and Business and Industry teams. Um, she's uh, uh, been at PDC since 2007 and has led a major reorganization of the, uh, of the agency designed to refocus on their core projects and programs uh, uh, with respect to economic development and job creation. I think she's going to bring a very interesting perspective to our panel. Next to Erin is Beth Osborne. She's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Transportation Policy at the U.S. Department of Transportation, where she works on the Surface Transportation Reauthorization. May it come quickly. Um, I guess it's too late for that, but may it come <laughs> soon. Um, the Secretary's Livability Initiative, as well as safety and environmental issues. And uh, as many of you know, she comes to USDOT by way of uh, Senator Carper's office, where she was his legislative assistant for transportation, uh, trade, uh, and labor policy. So we've got a really great panel, and uh, we're going to start off um, by, uh, uh, by, by having them make uh, uh, just an opening statement for us. But before we do that, um, the the you know, what's, what's great about the people that are assembled here is that they really represent one of the key uh, thrusts of, of uh, the, the federal administration and President Obama. Um, I think most of you know that uh, uh, last summer, uh, EPA, the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and, and USDOT came together in what was really a landmark interagency uh, uh, cooperative effort uh, to improve access to affordable housing, to provide us with more transportation options, to lower transportation costs while improving environmental quality and, and communities around uh, the, the nation. Um, I mean, they were doing something very unnatural. They were cooperating. <laughs> They're coordinating. Um, you know, and, 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 when you, and those of you who work in any of the, the, the programs of the federal government, you know, the, the whole, they're, they're all complex. The whole idea that they could, uh, that they could work together is, is really a, a mind-boggling thing. Since that time, there have been a lot of other federal agencies that have gotten into the spirit of this partnership, including the Departments of Energy, Agriculture, Commerce, and under the leadership of Rocco Landesman, the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, you're, you're familiar with the livability principles that they, that they put together, so I'm not going to go over that, but I, I will just say that uh, you know, the, uh, they're very much, Beth and, and, uh, and Shelley in particular, are very much hot off a series of recent uh, announcements. I know all the questions in this room could be, uh, why didn't I get a grant? Um, so we're, we're not going to do that. 
Uh, but, but they made big announcements about a second round of Tiger grants and uh, some really important HUD grants. But the, but the great thing about it is that they were totally in each other's business uh, doing those grants. And uh, that, that level of cooperation uh, is really uh, unheard of. And I, 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 we, one of the fascinating things I know they can tell us is, is even the evolution that they've seen in terms of the quality of the grants that are coming out of our communities as we're getting in tune with what it is that they're trying to do. And maybe even more importantly, they're getting in tune with what all of you are trying to do. So let me, let, let's just get started. Um, the, uh, the question that I'd really like people to, uh, to answer is, is, is really drawn from the, the description of our panel, uh, so, which talks about these sustainable community partnerships and the new economy. So what I want to know from each of you is, is uh, something about the ways in which your organization is engaging in new partnerships with other federal agencies, of course, but also at the local and regional level. And what are you hoping those new partnerships are going to yield in terms of sustainable communities and a stronger economy? Let me start with Shelley. Thanks, Harriet. That was a great intro. Um, this uh, program that we're standing up, the Sustainable Communities Initiative, is really trying to take what all of you have been doing for your entire careers and taking it up to the federal level. <coughs> All of us know that in order to make a great, livable, sustainable community, we have to think outside of the box. We've got to think about more than just a transit investment, but the people and the community around that transportation investment. And in order to do that, we can't simply you know, stay in our little world we have to reach out and become partners with a lot of other different folks. And that's part of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to model the behavior that you all started and that we all want uh, our partners at the local level to, uh, to take on as well. Um, Harriet mentioned just briefly, uh, but I'm not sure if you're all aware that this week we're announcing the first ever set of grants that are truly trying to promote this interdisciplinary planning and investments in communities in ways that are much more robust than what we have previously seen. Yeah. So a few facts for those who are not on all the tweets that are going out all over the place. Um, we announced uh, $98 million worth of regional planning grants to 45 regions around the country. Yeah. Yeah. And what is so cool about this is that we've got a lot of folks who have, were never on our radar now talking about these issues in an integrated way. Um, we had eight federal agencies involved in the selection of these grantees and 14 foundations. So a really collaborative process. We also did this crazy thing where Beth and I convinced our two agencies to join up and try and do something together and we've been sort of regretting it ever since, <laughs> but <laughs> it's all great. Uh, 61 grants to local communities who are trying to look at mobility options, pave the way for the kind of development that we want to see in communities, integrate the arts into the way we design our cities, make sure that artists can be part of a livable community, make sure that we're engaging with the business sector as we move forward. We can get more into the details of these programs, but um, this is going to be a new wave of energy and excitement. Many of you are part of this, but I think there's so much potential here. Uh, these programs were way oversubscribed, way oversubscribed. And it just, to me, shows there's a pent-up demand for thinking in the way that is integrated, interdisciplinary, and about the people that actually live in our communities. So I'll stop there, and uh, we'll have more time to talk about all that. Absolutely. Rocco. Thanks, Harriet. 
Partnerships are essential. I was just in Chicago at the convention of grant makers in the arts, and it was the federal partnership that most interested the foundation for it, the, the thing they wanted most to talk about. I talked about the reg regional planning NOFA. Of course, the first thing that I asked when I came into this job is, what's a NOFA? <laughs> uh, uh, that, that, uh, that Shelley's office oversaw, a NOFA that, is, that explicitly included the arts, which is a first for the NEA and a first for the, for the arts. The arts were the centerpiece of many of these grants, including Greenfield, Massachusetts, Hollywood, Florida, Rockford, Illinois, and Evansville, Indiana. None of them the usual, the usual suspects when you think about the arts. But let me point to Radford, Virginia, as a great example of what is possible. The New River Valley Planning District prioritized arts and culture as a core component in reconnecting its housing stock with regional amenities, placing art and culture on an equal footing with transportation, natural resources, water, infra water infrastructure, and food systems. The community has essentially redefined art and culture as a basic right, which in my view is something historic and important. Yeah. <laughs> I, met, I met with Tom Vilsack at the Department of Agriculture, who suggested that their community facilities program, which does a lot of construction in small towns and rural areas, would be an ideal place for engagement with the NEA, design, artist ac access, and workspaces. The Department of Education included the arts in their Promise Neighborhood Initiative, and we were talking to the Department of Commerce, the State Department, and even the Department of Defense. I was recently at, uh, having a dinner with, uh, with Kathleen Sebelius, and I was going on and on about uh, my plans and things we dreamed about doing, and, and she, at one point she stopped me and she said, wait a minute, I think I see what you're trying to do. You want to embed the arts into every federal agency. And I said, bingo, that's, uh, that's, that's right. That's exactly right. The arts should be part of domestic policy. They are one of our major exports, and they are uniquely positioned to complement and complete the work of other sectors uh, of our country. So how have I been making that case to the cabinet secretaries? Two words, art works. <laughs> uh, these two words have, have three meetings. It's a triple entendre. I'm an, I'm an old horse guy. I can't resist, resist a, a trifecta. Um, but uh, let me just explain briefly. Art works. These words refer, refer first to works of art what the NEA normally supports, to the creation of artists, uh, the heart of what we all support when we invest in artists and arts organizations. Secondly, artworks reminds us that, that those artworks work on us. They work to change and inspire us, to spark our imaginations, to challenge, confront, and comfort us. And finally, artworks is a declaration that reminds us that arts jobs are real jobs. 5.7 million full-time arts-related jobs in this country, plus 2 million full-time artists. In a world that increasingly allows us to work from anywhere, why does a person choose to live somewhere? The answer is in the things that, that have to be consumed in person, in place, and in real time. People choose where to live, based on, and survey after survey shows this, based on access to two things, good education and culture. Towns literally change and they change profoundly when you bring artists to the center of them, which is something that the Reinvestment Fund and the University of Pennsylvania have been studying. Three general conclusions stand out. One, the arts are a force for social cohesion and civic engagement. Arts participants are much more likely to engage in civic activities beyond the arts. They vote, they volunteer, and as community participation increases measurably, the result is more stable neighborhoods. Two, the arts make a major difference in child welfare. Income groups with a high cultural participation were more than twice as likely to have low truancy and juvenile delinquency rates. And three, art is a poverty fighter. It revitalizes local economies. Artists form clusters. Cultural institutions spring up near them. Arts lovers <coughs> gravitate to them. <coughs> Businesses follow. Businesses hire. The virtuous cycle continues. Beyond this, the arts contribute to quality of life foment creativity and innovation, and create neighborhood identity. And that's the combination of arguments that has been gaining traction with the cabinet secretaries, and they are also the argument behind our Mayor's Institute of City Design, MICD, which the NEA has for 25 years used as a partnership with the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the American Architectural Foundation. These institutes 
are opportunities for small groups of mayors to spend three days with design professionals tackling real-world problems and viewing themselves as their city's chief urban designers. Historically, the NEA helped mayors recognize the role the arts can play in building livable, sustainable communities. And last January, we added something more. We launched a funding stream called MICD25 that invested in 21 cities and towns that had the arts front and center in partnerships of city government, arts organizations, and the private sector. If you visit, if you visit our web website, arts.gov, you can see write-ups of all 21 projects. But let me just give you one example of, of the kind of thing we are doing. Winston-Salem, North Carolina, is replacing 11 highway bridges throughout its downtown business corridor, since we're in a transportation convening, I thought I would mention this one. With an MICD 25 grant, the local arts council created a coalition including North Carolina Department of Transportation, the city of Winston-Salem itself, and the Chamber of Commerce to ensure that artists and urban designers are full participants tasked with creating a master plan for the infrastructure projects, providing guidelines for design, lighting, sound walls, and bridge abutments, as well as water, water, water features, public art, and festival space adjacent to the right of way. Their goal is to create a new visual environment that physically embodies Winston-Salem as a city of the arts. As I've been traveling the country, I find an increasing consensus around this notion of creative placemaking, the ways that we can use the arts to help shape the physical, social, and economic character of towns and places all over. And I think if we all invest together, using a shared framework, there will, there will be a huge benefit, greater even than the sum of its parts. In short, art works. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Aaron, you have a little different perspective, of, you know, coming from the Portland region and, and more of a local perspective. We'd love to hear your weigh in on this. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I'm really delighted to hear that the federal government is um, promoting regional cooperation and interagency cooperation. Um, I think I have some perspective on this issue of inter interagency uh, cooperation working on the ground. Um, I'm with the Portland Development Commission and the Portland Development Commission is the city of Portland's economic development agency as well as its urban revitalization agency. So we're focused on business development and job creation, commercial property redevelopment, neighborhood revitalization, um, as well as infrastructure. So we invest in all of the above um, and our goal is really to create sustainable a sustainable city with economic opportunity um, for everyone. And what I will say in response to your question, first of all, I want to know if Portland got any of that money that you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> talk about that later. Um, I know we did get a Tiger Grant, which we're very um, happy about. One of the things that I have experienced um, in, a, in a pretty strong way since I've been in Portland, I've been here three years, and prior to coming to Portland, I worked nationally as a consultant on regional development, so really focused on why the region is the right unit for thinking about issues of economic development and transportation and housing. Now being, um, you know, working at the city level, I have to say there's a tendency in local government to just become incredibly siloed, to be focused on your specific agenda, be it job creation or housing or transportation. Everything we do at the Portland Development Commission has to be done in partnership. We work every day with our partners at the Bureau of Housing and the Bureau of Transportation, the Bureau of Planning. We work with Metro. We work with TriMet. We have to work collaboratively to get any of the big projects done. Um, but I think what, what we need our leaders to help us do, both at the city, state, and federal level, is to really create a vision of what a sustainable community means and how we all play a role with our different hats on and our different expertise to deliver on that vision of a sustainable community. Um, and so I think this, this work and this approach um, is really important. How we begin to drive that at the local level, I think, is going to be a tremendous challenge. Uh, you, have, you have siloed expertise, number one. 
Um, and then I'm speaking frankly, as I usually do. And then the other thing you have is you have tremendous competition at the jurisdictional level. So as much as we talk about regionalism and as much as we sort of recognize intellectually that that is the right way to think about how we work, our funding streams and our political leadership or whatever you know we're dealing with, whatever constraint we're dealing with drives us often to a more siloed and a more competitive approach. So we have to really be thinking, how do we change the incentives for how we work? Um, because we won't, we won't get there. I mean, people are well-intentioned and working really hard, but they're working in systems that drive them to work in a particular way. So that's, that's sort of a big point um, I'd like to make. Um, and I'll leave it at that, because I know we have time for questions to talk more about the economic development angle. Absolutely. Thanks. All right, yeah. I'm on cleanup. Um, so one of the lessons that I think Shelley and I in particular learned in our attempts to, in our successful attempts, to collaborate and break down silos is that silos are easy. <laughs> Way easier than coordination. There's a reason we get caught into these silos. Um, and the challenges are often incredibly surprising. It's not getting your high leadership agreeing to pool money or to rel relinquish some control over the decision-making process. It becomes your budget systems are different or your computer systems don't coordinate and communicate. It, it is really amazing. And the only way you figure out how to deal with it is to do it. And uh, I think the next time through, we're going to have so much easier of a time. But the only way to break it down is just to barrel through and, and figure it out as you go. Um, we have had a very exciting couple of weeks here with uh, the regional grants being announced. Uh, uh, EPA and DOT got to be a part of that process and, and evaluate the finalists and give some recommendations to HUD and that they factored into their decision-making process. And, um, and they were, uh, obviously, EPA was also a part of a coordinating process between HUD and DOT and our joint local planning grants. And I think that uh, this, this program was very interesting in that we are seeing attempts to collaborate across the federal government. Um, there was a, a big effort amongst a bunch of agencies that all had economic development programs to pool all of those various programs together. But one of the reasons they sought to pool them is because they all fund the exact same sorts of activities. The thing that was interesting about what um, HUD and, and DOT did, and I have to give credit to HUD because they're the ones that really started pushing this idea from the start, is we had two programs that if you look at the eligible expenses do not overlap very much. HUD's program for localized planning was looking at site area planning and um, uh, building and zoning code changes, and DOT was looking at traditional transportation planning, design and engineering of a, a transit system or a roadway. And uh, what we, the reason we came together is we recognized at the local level, those two things, when done well, are not done separately. We at the federal government view them as different, and we put them in different departments with different experts and different timelines and different requirements. But at the local level, if you're trying to put together a good transit system, you are clearly looking at your land use decision making and, and site area planning around each, each station. And so the reason we came together was in hopes that we could start to imitate the collaborations that were existing at the local level where projects were being done well. Um, the, the sorts of projects we ended up funding also, interestingly, all had a connection to redevelopment and economic development. Every last one of them promoted not just these changes for the good of the community, but these, these changes for the purpose of revitalizing a community and bringing jobs and, and people back to that community. What we're hoping to do is encourage more collaboration, more planning, more innovation, a broader recognition and ability to calculate the costs and benefits of these projects. Um, and uh, most of all, to have a bunch of results on the ground. What, let people see what sorts of projects can be built when we remove some of the traditional barriers. In, in the transportation program, we designed a highway and a transit program. 
through programs like TIGER, which the announcements occurred today, we are funding many projects that will have an extraordinary impact on communities, uh, regions, and the national economy, several of which are ineligible for funding under our current program, period. We are funding uh, sponsors that have no avenue to come to the federal government except through this program. And so what we're trying to demonstrate is when you release some of these constraints, you open the door to more applicants, more innovation, what do you get as a result? And with so far two rounds of this under our belt, hopefully take that into the reauthorization debate and make the case to Congress, the American people, that uh, a system that permits this sort of innovation is what we want to see in reauthorization. Beth, I think you said that really well. Um, you all of the agencies that, the, uh, that are represented here have been very clever. Uh, someone, in, a, in the opening statement yesterday, someone talked about how cunning Portland is. I think, I think you've been very cunning, all of you, um, to, to find these new pots of money, brand new pots of money, and using them to, to develop programs that demonstrate the efficacy of a different way of doing business, a more collaborative way, a less siloed way, um, and, and, to, and to really try to stress a much broader set of benefits that could accrue uh, from using the dollars in this way. And that, and that it, it's, it's smart to do that. It's, it's smart not to wait to try to create a program that Congress has to authorize and, and, and all of that. It's, it's also smart to show how efficient this is, how you can spend one dollar and maybe get, for once, more than one dollar worth of benefit out of what you're doing. So, I think that's really terrific. So I want to hear a little bit more about it, and I think our audience does too. You, you mentioned that some of the things that you're hoping to demonstrate with these new programs, but how is that going? Because the challenge, obviously, is that if someone's starting a new project, especially if, in the case of Tiger, it's capital dollars, um, you know, that, that stuff doesn't happen overnight. In Shelley's case with planning, you know, you, you, uh, you, you absolutely want to encourage great planning. Uh, but you don't always get the results of great planning immediately. So tell me a little bit about how, uh, about what you're hoping to get out of these new programs and some of the early results and influence that you're already starting to have. Anybody? Well, maybe I could, I could start with that. I mean, I think one of the most gratifying aspects of being able to work on this is that we are having a chance to redefine what our definition of sustainability is. That it's not just like groovy environmental stuff, although that is really, really important. And remember, I'm from Eugene, so I know all about that. Um, but it's about uh, making sure that we're growing our local economies in a way, I've heard Aaron speak about this, about how, you know, both members of a couple can move to a place and get, both get jobs. That would be good. Um, that, you know, we're uh, enriched in our lives by being in a culture that, uh, energizes us every day and that it's not just for the elite it is everybody that's benefiting from all this stuff and so um, I think that the more that we really get down to what are we trying to achieve here and we think about it in those kinds of terms I think we'll be able to make so much more progress. I mean, I guess, you know, in terms of measures of success, um, this is not just because Rocco's here, but I, I'm all, I think, like, what if it was just about, you know, happenings and performance art being an outcome of some of this work? I mean, I think getting people energized and committed into uh, discussions about um, civic life is a really important step that we need to make in this uh, country. In addition to building all the cool stuff, like re-engaging people in those kinds of discussions. Yeah. Um, just building off of Shelley's point, uh, in terms of what we mean about 
sustainable community, uh, sustainable neighborhoods. The language varies depending on what community you're in. Um, but w one of the things that we're really focused on here in Portland right now, um, and I think it's important to talk about, is this notion of um, how economic development and sustainability uh, connect. And in Portland in particular, and in this region, I think we have this tremendous, tremendous capacity for planning and placemaking and transportation infrastructure. And um, it's celebrated, and you're all very familiar with, with the story, I think, of, of, of Portland and its trajectory over 30 or 40 years. Um, and we do have an incredible quality of place, an incredible transportation infrastructure, but I think a question that we're really asking ourselves right now as a city, and certainly our mayor is very, very focused on this issue, is how do we leverage all this infrastructure? How do we leverage this brand and this, this reputation uh, and this quality of place and quality of life we have and, and convert that into competitive advantage um, for wealth creation and economic growth? Because to have a sustainable place without high quality jobs for everybody who, who wants them and is able to, to fulfill themselves in that way is not really the place we want to create. I mean, my point is it's, it, it can't be all about physical development. It also has to be about economic development and job creation. And so I think bringing those two conversations together um, is really a key step in this integrated uh, approach that we're, we're talking about. I think that uh, that you raise a really interesting point. When a lot of people talk about the new economy, they really think of knowledge workers, and they think of mm -hmm. the requirements uh, requirements for uh, the ticket for entry into the new economy is a is a, at least one degree, maybe advanced degrees. But uh, but you know when when you talk Rocco about art works uh, and how many people in the country are employed in creative endeavor, can you can you speak a little bit to uh, to what are the kinds of jobs that are available in, in the arts, and, and how does that figure into uh, to the not new economy that we're talking about? Well, just to pick up on what Aaron was just saying, uh, this is right dead center of what we're starting to talk about now. One of the things we've learned in recent years, it used to be thought that, that people uh, followed businesses. They moved to where businesses are. We now know it's the opposite, that businesses want to move where there's an educated, committed, enlightened workforce. Uh, the businesses follow the people. So, so we, it, it's, it's the field of dreams in reverse. I, if you come, they will build it. <laughs> and uh, what, what we know is that when you have culture, art and artists in the, in the center of a place, it attracts people and it attracts activity and businesses will follow. And I've been going around the country seeing one example after another after another of this. It's gotten stupidly obvious to me. You, you, Cincinnati, Ohio, the north of the Rhine section was a place mainly of drug dealers and high crime and nobody ever went. Well, they put an art gallery in, some artist housing followed, a theater went in there. Little by little, the entire neighborhood started to change. Now there's street life, there's activity. It is, has, has been catalytic in terms of the change of the entire neighborhood. In Boston, where we were, Harriet, um, Emerson College moving downtown into the combat zone, one of the toughest areas in the country, renovating the Paramount Theater uh, now there's street life, people are walking around at night, it's safe, people are engaged. This was really started by Mayor Daley yeah, uh, in 1989 in, in Chicago when he came in. The very first thing he did was took all the old vaudeville houses that were in a state of disrepair and falling down, spent an enormous amount of money, had tremendous criticism for it, uh, renovated those houses and created a theater district. It transformed downtown Chicago. And that's being done in place after place. It was, it was done in Greensboro, North Carolina. Where you, you know, a theater came in there uh, to a rundown neighborhood. A cafe opens up next door. A gallery opens up down the street from that. And suddenly, it's a different downtown. And these hollowed out downtowns are starting now to be vital, vibrant places. You see it here in Portland. Oh, yeah. it's, a, it's, it's almost a, a perfect example. And the arts, uh, I mean, it seems so obvious to me, of course, I'm prejudiced, but the arts can play a tremendous catalytic role in revitalizing neighborhoods and communities. I, I certainly have to say that after spending some time in Portland, I can, I can no longer think of a streetscape as being complete unless it has some really lively and interesting art. And I yeah. think that in many ways that this, uh, 
that this really broadens our definition of when we think of what's a complete street or what's mm -hmm. a sustainable community, what it, what it can and I, and, I, and I would go the next step to, to even suggest that the arts can be a catalyst for the, exactly the kinds of collaboration that we're talking about among our different agencies. And we're, we're starting to see that in, in Memphis, which is a, a, a town with a 39% with a, with a, uh, a poverty rate. Um, there, if, you if you talk to Mayor Wharton about the, the plans for the city, he sees the arts as a fulcrum for this kind of collaboration. There's a, um, I mean, Beth, there's a trolley line that's kind of a tourist line, but they want to expand that into a, into a mode of real transportation that will, con will, that will connect outlying neighborhoods to the cultural district. There's a um, great charter school there in, in Soulsville that's been catalytic. Well, if that could be replicated in different places, that's something for the Department of Education. Artist housing downtown is at the center of what he's thinking about for the revitalization of the city, and, that, and that's HUD. So the arts can play a role, I think, with all the agencies in being a fulcrum for that kind of revitalization. I really believe that. Well, you've described a thesis that, uh, that, that basically involves creating great places in every sense of that word, places with lots of choices, places with lots of opportunity, and that whatever our future economy is going to be, and sometimes it's hard to sit here and know, mm -hmm. you know, as, as, as so many things uh, shift, that, that whatever your economic reason for being in the future, uh, that it's going to begin with having a great place. But let's talk about... I mean, I mean Harriet, I know that you're the moderator, but you can talk in Washington about, <laughs> about how that's done. I mean, you, you, you've done it. I, on another panel, I might do that, <laughs> not on this one. Um, the, thank you, though, Rocco. Thank you. Uh, we, we are going to be hosting Revolution next year in Washington. I'll Yay. talk about it tomorrow. How's that? <laughs> um, you know, but, but we're in the middle of a recession, hopefully coming out of a recession. What, what does sustainable communities uh, mean in terms of resilience? the economic resilience of, of households and of neighborhoods and of whole communities. And, and, and talk to me a little bit more about, about, uh, about the role that sustainable communities can play in, 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 in that resilience or, or maybe being a catalyst uh, for, for larger economic development efforts. Well, uh, as opposed to the way I think uh, we've often talked about sustainability, livability, smart growth in the past, the three things I tend to focus on the majority of the time are the reason you want a livable community is it saves people money, it saves the taxpayer money, and it's what people want. It saves people money because their transportation costs, in particular their so combined housing and transportation costs, are significantly lower than in auto-dependent areas. And this creates not just a more resilient household, but a more resilient community. A community whereby people can choose less expensive modes of transportation, take the money they would have spent on transportation, protect their home, uh, put, put money into savings, and education, and retirement, and investments in their community, or frankly, just go about living their lives. Um, a, a livable community is one where, by doing the sort of inter interdisciplinary planning that HUD is encouraging um, through their sustainable communities program, and that we're hopefully going to be funding the great projects that come out of. Uh, we can save the taxpayer dollars. Those, those communities that have done this and have looked to put new, um, uh, new economic development around areas where the infrastructure already exists save a fortune on avoided infrastructure investment. At a time where our program is really struggling for funding, we really can't afford to not discuss those issues. These are communities that, that are good for the budget. And then, of course, the, the biggest reason that, that my boss is involved in it is because it's just what people are begging for. So if you want to be the community that folks want to move to, you're going to build like this. And that's what, what we're finding. I, I, I've often said that I've read a bunch of market surveys that talk about um, approximately 30% of the housing market is looking for a vibrant, walkable community where it, it's close to retail and, and jobs and, and activity but we only have about 2% supply to meet that demand. And um, it, it, in fact, was the foundation of our partnership with HUD. Uh, the Federal Transit Administration joined with HUD because we discovered every time someone started to plan a rail transit line, developers would purchase all the land along that new line in, because they knew that they could make a whole lot of money there off of high-end development. And until we raise the the supply to meet that demand, we're going to continue to see that problem. There's really no policy way around the fact that we're not building what people are begging us to build. 
So, I mean, the reason this is so important is it saves people money, it's good for the budget, and people are begging us for it. Can I uh, build off that just in terms of saving people money? We actually, uh, Joe Courtright, which many of you are familiar with, he's an economist based in Portland. He does a lot of work with CEOs for City. He's actually quantified the green dividend for Portland. And just by way of background, um, we have in Portland, um, our residents are twice as likely to use transit to get to work and seven times more likely to ride their bike to work than the average uh, US city. So you have a culture here that really is wanting, demanding alternative forms of transportation and ways of getting to work. And Joe has estimated that that saves the Portland metropolitan region $2.6 billion annually. So that's more money in people's pockets that they can spend on stuff they really care about, like beer and <laughs> coffee and uh, good food, spend more time with their family. The other thing I wanted to just note on this, and I love your point of the reverse um, field of dreams, uh, if they... If they come, you will build it. If they come, you will build it. So one of the things that we're seeing, and I think this is very much about this culture that's kind of taking root in Portland, that you know, we can talk about what sustainability is and we can try to be theoretical about it, but there's just a whole bunch of people who live in Portland who are living it every day and they're not necessarily talking about it, they're doing it. And a lot of these people, young people who are moving to Portland, really gravitating to the city because of the progressive values and the focus on sustainability, they want to work for companies that one, reflect their values, that enable them to ride transit to work um, or bike commute. And so what we're seeing are employers who are saying, we want to relocate. We want to move from our suburban office park into Portland and be on transit because all of our creative talent lives in these close-in neighborhoods and they want to bike to work. So it actually becomes a competitive advantage for these companies to be located on transit and it, it's kind of a response to the people. The talent's here, mm -hmm. this is what the talent wants, and the private sector is responding um, to their desires. So it's, it's sort of, it, I like that notion of the reverse field. Well, and I'd like to jump on what you're saying, Erin, because this is especially true with younger folks, yes. uh, the millennial generation, yes. which while they're a growing portion of our overall population or a shrinking portion of our driving population, and there's a lot of reasons for that. There's obviously, at the very young end, graduated driver's licenses and things like that. But there's also just a fact that there's a lifestyle choice now where people like to stay connected. It has become more and more expensive to buy a car. I mean, when I was a teenager, you could buy a car and my dad could fix it up for me. But these days with computerized cars, that's not, you can't con continually rebuild a car. Um, and so people are looking for communities where they can live this, particularly young folks with choices, are wanting to move to communities where these options are available and cities that want them to move there are going to take that seriously. That's cities of all sizes too. When uh, last year uh, about this time, my boss and, and uh, Secretary Donovan and Administrator Jackson traveled to a couple communities to look at what they're doing and one of the places we went to was Dubuque, Iowa. And Dubuque, Iowa just attracted 1,400 jobs from IBM to their downtown and one of the reasons IBM moved there is Dubuque was putting a lot of money into rebuilding their downtown and creating a vibrant, though small, uh, 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 downtown area. And they knew, IBM knew that was the way that they could get young people to locate close to them, where they could attract talent, both because there's a small university there and because it was a place where you could walk, shop, go out for a beer, and then walk home. We're seeing a lot of that here as well. Shannon? Well, I think, um, I, I don't want to be like a downer, but <laughs> 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 we're all so happy about all this. I do think that at the same time that we're facilitating, celebrating, you know, promoting all of this, um, responding to the employers who want to be you know, in places where they can attract the talent, we have to be extremely mindful of the fact that we have a supply and demand imbalance that is severe. And um, we have to be proactive 
about making sure that we have affordable ways of, of being part of this. I think that actually this, this region has done an excellent job of finding ways as communities rebuild uh, to ensure that there is affordable housing integrated into neighborhoods. Um, now, you're not, you know, it doesn't happen by accident. I, it does there's not no place happen. that you're that you see where you just get affordable <coughs> housing without paying any attention to it. And and like building this stuff and making it groovy and green and zero impact on the environment, it is, it's costly. And we have to find a way to make sure that you know the affordability piece isn't the thing that we ditch that that actually has to be a fundamental component well i think that you know you're, the fact that you have a collaboration uh, i think is is a, a incredibly important thing and i know i could go on having this conversation i want to have you all over to dinner this would be a great dinner party right here <laughs> with all of you of course um, but um, i think it would be great if people wanted to to ask this panel a few questions um, you know, we have a few minutes where we could take some questions, so uh, why, don't we, why don't we try to do that? There are some mics at, at either end here. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, it's great to see you guys in Portland. It's great to be back in Portland myself. Uh, a question for you. Um, we've got local folks and federal folks up at the table, and it's great to see money coming from the federal government to local government, but still the vast majority of your funding goes through the state capitol. Um, how do we effectively engage state government in these discussions? You talked about the Mayor's Institute. How do we engage the governors in creative placemaking? What, what are your ideas in that regard? Um, I think all of you have probably have an answer. Rocco, do you want to start? Well, 40% for, of our money goes, direct, goes to the states. And what we need to do is to make the states are full partners in, in our, our initiatives. And we have, we have a, a new uh, budget proposal before Congress for a program called Our Town. And um, it's called Our Town because I'm a theater guy and I'm, 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 I get to name things as, 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 as the chairman. Uh, but, but it's also called, called Our Town because it's about placemaking, the, using the arts as, uh, as, as, as placemakers. And part of the job is to enlist, enlist the, uh, the states but also um, the, uh, to be our partners, but also the private sector. And that's something I didn't mention or only obliquely referred to. Uh, but one of the things I've found since we started to have these kinds of conversations and these collaborations is that the private sector is very excited about it. We have started to convene um, the major arts funding foundations, and we were talking about the biggest foundations in the country. Uh, and we're, we're getting a lot of traction with them. And one of the main reasons is they see what's going on in the federal government in terms of your collaboration, in terms of working, uh, working together, cooperating. They want to do that among themselves and work alongside you in, in this rebuilding of communities and places and, and, and neighborhood revitalization. They're very engaged by this. And I think we're going to see within the next very short time uh, significant um, effort by the private sector here alongside us. I know, Beth, especially for you, almost all of your formula funding goes directly to states, and you had talked earlier about having new recipients that you would have never been able to reach but for your Tiger Grants. Can you speak a little bit more about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, just starting with our formula grants, though, um, we have this bizarre system now where some people have claimed we have 108 programs. We only count about 92, but that's <laughs> egregious enough. Only 92. <laughs> And uh, the idea that you're going to elicit great innovation and clarity of thought out of your state DOTs with 92 programs is a questionable hypothesis, thesis statement. Um, through Tiger, and, and I, I would love to say it's because of the brilliance of the way we created the program, but I think it's frankly just having some discretionary dollars there. Um, it, it encourages people to compete, to show innovation, to show uh, that they're the most collaborative and they've got the most partnership. Because there's not a lot of money to go around, those who are most successful came up with a great deal of local match, which means they needed a lot of parties, especially in this economy, to come together. So collaboration was strongly rewarded uh, and, and innovation was strongly re rewarded. If you look at our tire list, which was posted on our website today, 
you will notice a huge variety of applicants from uh, cities to MPOs to transit districts to, uh, to state DOTs. But what was most interesting this time out is in most cases, even where the state DOT was not the lead applicant, they were still there. They were putting money there. They were playing. They were uh, a part of the collaboration. And I think that needs to be our goal. In the past, folks have been concerned that the only way to, uh, you know, to get around the juggernaut of the, the, the state DOT power is to create avenues for people to get in separately. I don't know that that is the only solution. It's something we need to discuss as we're going forward in reauthorization is what, what you asked, which is how do we bring the states into areas that, they have, that have not been seen within their purview, make them care, make them put resources there too. I, I think we have folks that are very open to doing that, but we just haven't had a program that rewarded anyone for trying. So we're trying to do that now. We have another question? Absolutely. Uh, Art Pierce from the City of Portland. Um, so I really applaud um, all the collaboration that seems to be happening at the federal level and um, how that supports the efforts that we're doing. Um, one thing that I've observed is I think that the relationship between the federal investments from different organizations may actually be furthering our equity challenge. So I, this is the, a, a good group to talk about this, I think, here. Uh, so for instance, the FTA local match requirements leads local jurisdictions to pursue equity um, recapture mechanisms locally that then further puts pressure on the station areas in terms of the economics of those station areas and has to further require more HUD subsidy to make those communities equitable. So I think, I, I, I hope you're talking about that at the federal level, but I think there's a relationship between the investments of one entity and the investments of another trying to make up for um, the, others, the others' requirements. So I, I think that was a comments. comment, right, not a question. Well, so the question, I guess, is um, how, in what way is, thank you, uh, in what way is the federal government discussing these concerns at the, the high levels? So. Well, well, so um, it's funny how the term equity has so many different meanings that, you know, we've got equity in our house, we've got equity in an investment like a transit system, we've got equity in terms of fairness, um, and all of them sort of woven together there. Um, you know, maybe this is sort of a combining of, the la of, of these two comments, or question and comment. Um, right now, when HUD gives money out through its formula programs, it goes either to what are called entitlement communities, cities over a certain population with certain poverty levels, and it goes to states. Those, in, a, in one metro region, you have a patchwork of, quote, entitlement communities and state jurisdictions. And yet, we know that housing markets are regional in nature. They're not jurisdictional. Um, and when we make an investment like a transit project, we're generally making it at this regional level. It crosses jurisdictional boundaries. And yet, the tools that we have to make sure that we have a comprehensive, integrated strategy to deal with value capture, to deal with focusing, say, uh, housing vouchers and place-based um, uh, tenant assistance, uh, low-income housing tax credits, focusing those into transit corridors. We have a pretty limited toolkit. And so part of what uh, HUD is working on right now which I could really use all your help on because you guys are all, you know, super pros at kind of the MPO uh, reform world. But we need a comparable solution at the regional level for housing issues. Um, and we've talked about uh, conditioning the allocation of our formula funds, whether they go to an entitlement community or going to the state, on the creation of a regional strategy that deals with the allocation of all kinds of housing resources and economic development resources at that scale. Um, Secretary Donovan often talks in this sort of, you know, happy way about couldn't we just have one plan for every region that shows <laughs> what we're going to invest in? Um, Pretty simple, but actually that's incredibly compelling. 
And we ought to try and see if we couldn't do some of that. I, I know that there are lots of other questions, and I hate to cut this off, but I'd love to give our speakers the opportunity to say, have the last word. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about, um, uh, we, we were beginning to talk about, was, uh, uh, you know, a little bit about how younger people are changing our ideas of, of, of what's a great community to live in. So I'd love to hear your thoughts just kind of one by one, very rapid fire. You know, uh, you know tell me some things about what's, what's coming to constitute the good life in America, okay? You know, how are people gonna be thinking of it over the next 10 and 20 years? You know, not the, not the, uh, the picket fence on the one acre lot and the two cars in the garage where it has been for the last 40 years. Go, Beth. Uh, the way I think about it, uh, I live in Washington, D.C., and we got clobbered by a snowstorm, two snowstorms, this past uh, winter. And the, the good life for me was even the fact that we had two feet of snow on the ground and nothing could really get in or out. I still had a fully functioning community. that I could still go out to dinner. I could still go to the grocery store. The grocery store shelves weren't cleared out. I could walk on my own two little feet, even though that the street hadn't yet been plowed. And it just demonstrated how resilient a community can be when you design it for people. Um, I'm gonna say a couple, two, two, two things. Smaller, cheaper, better. Uh, I, think, I think long commutes, big SUVs and mansions hopefully are a thing of the past. Um, and we're gonna be living in more compact communities, more walkable communities. We're using the term here in Portland, 20 minute neighborhoods, where you can basically walk to meet all your essential needs um, in 20 minutes. And so I think people are very, very excited about that vision of how we move forward. Great, Rocco. Well, I'm just very happy to be at this table. And I don't mean just surrounded by four very attractive women. <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, in, the, in the bigger sense of the table, I, uh, for, for the arts, and I, I believe in all my heart that when you're talking about livability and quality of life, you have to include the arts. Absolutely. Shelley. Okay, one comment and one commercial. Um, I, my uh, daughters are 12-year-old twins. I want them to have so much hope and engagement in the future and really feel like they're part of a community that is gonna support them into the future. Uh, and a sense of inquiry and excitement about living in, in America. So that's what I'm hoping we get out of this. The commercial is that um, we just uh, posted on uh, our collective websites for this partnership this really great little piece on accomplishments over the last year. It was kind of spearheaded by the EPA. A uh, lot in here. Please go download it. Great. Well, let's thank our terrific panel.